Let's talk about migration. Some people yeah. in Kent are actually frightened. There when are some people who are frightened, they are but there are also lots of people who are getting jobs because of migration. It's an incredibly fraught topic in many countries, I realize. But that's odd because this isn't a new phenomenon. Humans have been moving forever. Human history is one big story of movement and migration. So how many migrants are there today? It's actually about 200 million people in total, which is less than 3% of the global population. Meanwhile, it might seem like all migrants come from poor countries and move to wealthy countries, but in reality, about half of all migrants, half of that 200 million figure, live in developing countries. And what if I told you that many, if not most countries, are soon going to need more migrants? that some of them are even going to start competing for them. Fears of losing a vital safety net for the nation's elderly. Many countries are aging fast. They're just not having enough children to maintain their current population levels. Take Italy. For every woman in the country, just 1.2 children are being born, far below the 2.1 that is needed to maintain the current population. By the end of the century, its population is expected to be like half of what it is today. Not only that, but when you look at the age breakdown of its population today, you spot another problem. You have more old people than children today. What happens when they're elderly? Who's gonna take care of them? And as they draw on social services, pensions, other programs, there'll be relatively fewer working age people paying into those systems. It's not only Italy or rich countries, similar dynamics are playing out in middle income countries as well. Countries like Bangladesh, Colombia, Mexico, Turkey, just to name a few. Only a generation ago, there were four or five kids in each family. Today, the birth rates have fallen below replacement levels, and they continue to go down, meaning these countries face significant population declines. They may well become old before they get rich, and thus less equipped than wealthy countries to handle pressure on social services from an aging population. And yet, some countries have the opposite problem a population explosion. Take Niger, Somalia, Afghanistan just as examples. Their birth rates are well above replacement levels, nearly seven kids per woman in Niger. And age breakdowns show how young these populations are. In just a few short years, these youngsters will be adults. Their population is increasing very fast. They may not have the natural resources that are needed for so many people to eat, have shelter, and prosper. Where will they find jobs, and what happens if they don't? And then there's the climate angle. It could aggravate many of the factors that spur people to move, in some cases with no real prospects for employment and often at great risk. These are dramatic problems that are going to have to be addressed, and migration could play a major role. So how can migration work? To find out, let's phone up the directors of the 2023 World Development Report. You know, the report says that migration can be the solution to the demographic challenges that we lay out at the beginning of the video. Okay. Can you explain that? We have to recognize that not all migrants are the same. There are different types of movement, and each of them calls for a different response. What do you mean by that? Now, traditionally, there have been two ways to look at this. On the one hand, you have the economic perspective. It's essentially a question of costs and benefits. Does migration bring costs? Does it bring benefits? Fundamentally, it's about whether migrants bring skills that match the needs of the destination economy. If they do, great, everybody gains. If they don't, things get complicated because essentially this school of thought will say, well, the cost of integrating them are higher than their potential contribution. But if someone doesn't have skills that are in demand, the, the, the needed skills. But that's not the end of the story because you see there's another way to look at it. After World War II, countries agreed that when people flee conflict, violence or persecution, they should be granted asylum. They should be provided with a safe place to stay, regardless of the cost. And so the central question, what's driving people movement? Is this because they have a fear for their life in their country of origin? Or is it because they are seeking opportunities in the country of destination? So, so who then is right? It's not a question of right or wrong. It's really a question of having two different ways to look at the same issue. And that sometimes creates controversies or misunderstandings. And so what we've tried to do with this report is to combine the two perspectives. When we bring uh, these two approaches together, things become much more manageable and they make much more sense. Vast majority of the migrants migrate for economic reasons. They, are, they provide the skills that are a strong match in the destination labor market and the community. But, but, but wait a minute, how do you decide what is costly, what is beneficial? Basically the match, the extent of the match is determined by the migrants' uh, human capital as well as the policy environment 
and the social environment in the destination community. On origin countries, I can't help but think that that migration, especially if we're talking about people who have skills, who have in-demand skills, don't they stand to lose you know, their, their the most valuable workers? There are social implications for the, the origin country, no doubt. But there are policy measures that origin countries can implement where the, the, the negative effects are minimized and the gains are maximized. So remittances is one of them, right? I left home, I came here, and when my parents need money, I send them back. But the real impact is not necessarily this this money. It's about human capital. It's about social capital. What about people who who don't have in-demand skills? It, it, I mean, it all sounds very straightforward, very easy so far. But what about other people? Yeah, well, Paul, it's a good point. So this is where things get a bit complicated. So some of these people are refugees, and um, as a result, they're fleeing conflict um, and violence, and so they need to be protected, and that's that's under international law. But again, if they don't bring the right skills for the destination country, then there's going to be a cost for the host country. And so the question is, you know, how do we manage that cost? What do you mean by that? There's two things that we can do here. So first is to share the cost internationally. Because refugees are fleeing conflict, they usually end up in the first country, first safe country that they can get to. Only 10% of countries are hosting a very significant number of refugees. So that means there's 90% of countries that are not. They need to be doing much more. If they're not going to take in the refugees, then maybe give them some money. It's still expensive to, to host refugees, no? Great. So that's my point. So the second thing that we can you know, try to do is actually reduce these costs because yes, it is very expensive. Maybe instead of leaving them in a tent or in a camp and providing food, we should help these refugees get to a place where they can find a job and work and sustain themselves and actually contribute to the economy, which many refugees would like to do. Sure, but when, when I read the news, the, the controversy doesn't seem to be with migrants who have in-demand skills or even with refugees. It seems there's a lot of concern about what to do when people don't have skills and frankly, people who aren't refugees. Yeah, so the bottom left quadrant do not qualify for international protection. And there are those whom qualifications, whom profile are going to be a very weak match for the destination society. Think about some who are fleeing a society plagued with crime, but that would not qualify them for refugee protection. No matter what political controversies, no matter what the social anxieties that those flows might be creating, we are dealing with human beings. I think we need to also acknowledge that a lot of people are fleeing not conflict, not persecution, but poverty. They are fleeing decreasing incomes, decreased agricultural productivity because, because of a warming weather, and giving them the opportunity to migrate internally, to adapt in the country so that they don't have to take those dangerous routes is also the longer-term option for providing a more orderly migration. And for the rest, we need to acknowledge that there is development so that it changes the incentive to migrate. But countries administratively need to be able to return them in a human way because their sovereignty is also part of that equation. What's your key takeaway from a year of thinking about migration so intensely? So I think the, the main takeaway is migration uh, is a, a global phenomenon. It has always been the case and it will always be the case. And this is a great source of opportunity for prosperity for countries of every income level. Thank you.